And we want to begin by talking about the rise of the far right in Ireland and the fact that, look, a lot of people might have said we've seen a lot of rhetoric online, but we're now seeing this coming to the streets. Was this entirely predictable? Um, I think in some ways it is quite predictable, to be honest, but I think it's also very important to note that this kind of activity has actually been going on for quite a number of years. Um, People might remember back in 2018 and 2019, there were protests against planned direct provision centres in towns like Uchtarart and Galway and Maville and Donegal. There was also an arson attack Mm. on um, a planned centre there as well. So this kind of activity has been happening, right? Um, But what we're seeing is that it's changing in a number of ways. I think the frequency of the protests that we've seen recently is, is, is definitely something to note. The other thing that is quite worrying is that the rhetoric that's been used to kind of rile people up mm-hmm. is becoming more extreme. So if you think back to those protests, say the one in Uchtarart in 2019, the way the far right were kind of infiltrating local communities there online specifically was that they were setting up Facebook groups, right? And they would set them up with a title like Uchtarart against inhumane direct provision, right? So they were playing on the very real concerns that people have about how people were being treated in direct mm. provisions kind of pull people into these Facebook groups. They would then litter the Facebook groups with, you know, conspiracy theories about multiculturalism and, and different kind of things to kind of, you know, spur on this kind of anti-migrant sentiment. Now what we're seeing is, number one, that narrative about inhumane direct provision is gone. That is mm. completely, you know, they, it seems that, that they, they don't even pretend to care about that anymore. That faux concern has disappeared. Exactly, yes. Um, obviously, the protests that are taking place now are taking place outside centres that are actually housing asylum seekers as well. There weren't people in those centres when this was happening in 2019. Mm. And the language that has been used to describe them is very deliberate. So they use words like invasion. They say that Ireland is, is uh, this is a new plantation, which is obviously playing on kind of past attractions that have happened to Ireland. Um, they will say unvetted military mm. age men to give this idea that, you know, there's some kind of a threat, that these people are a threat. So I think that, you know, as much as it's been happening for quite a long time, as I say, the, the, the kind of extreme end of it is becoming more and more apparent. Yeah, because this is something you often heard in politics for many years is that we don't have a far right problem in Ireland, Mm -hmm. that we'd look at things like the UK and the US and say, well, thank God we don't have any of that here. Mm -hmm. Was there a naivety to that? Because let's talk about some of the the main groups and some of the main sort of online entities which have organised these things. I mean, they, as you're saying, they didn't, you know, spring out of the ground overnight. Absolutely not. I mean, they've they've been here for years. And I do think that we have a bit of a tendency in this country to go, sure, we're not racist. Do you know what I mean? And that's a kind of, it's a dangerous kind of complacency. Do you know what I mean? We are as susceptible to the same kind of things that people are all over the world. Now, there is an, an element, I think, to, to kind of discuss here about the fact that they haven't had, a, and when I say they, I mean the far right, haven't had as much success here as they have had internationally. But that can change in the blink of an eye. And I think something like this, it could be the... I suppose the the kind of sparks for 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 them kind of gaining more of a foothold in society. Um, and the other thing that is very important to talk about here is the the effect that COVID had and the pandemic had on ask, how these. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So the way I try and describe this is that before the pandemic, you had all these movements that kind of, they lived on their own spaces online. So you had the kind of anti-vaccine movement, you had the far right extremists, you had QAnon. There was a bit of an overlap, kind of imagine it like a Venn diagram. So slight overlaps in the way they, they kind of, you know, communicated and stuff like that. But essentially the pandemic brought them all together. So when you go online now and you look at, say, telegram groups that were set up for anti-lockdown protests, they are wall to wall anti-asylum seeker stuff now. So they are being used to kind of like filter all this kind of, you know, broadly conspiratorial themes, I suppose. So with COVID, the common denominator there then? Um, COVID, I suppose, because a lot of those groups are bound by conspiratorial belief um, and they all kind of formed conspiratorial beliefs about COVID. Um, and it's more, I suppose it's, there's a psychological element. So it's the fact that belief in one conspir- conspiracy theory kind of, pre, you know, you, you tend to believe in more than one if you believe in one already. Mm-hmm. And then, sorry, the other little point is the way that algorithms work online as well. So people would have been kind of fed similar content, I suppose, across these different yeah. communities that, as well. That might be ask, answering the question that I was about to ask, because what mm. I was going to ask was, was it just a, a function of how much time people spent indoors and online over mm. the pandemic? Or, or how did the bubbles begin to merge? Like, If you start off in an anti-immigration bubble, how does that then merge with other you know, anti-vaccine bubbles? How do they all then kind of conglomerate? Is it just because people were online and nothing better to do and they stumbled down rabbit holes? Or was there something about the algorithms that actually drove them together? Yeah, there's a bit of both going on, I think, right? Because obviously at the start of the pandemic, no one really had answers to what was going on. We were all stuck at home, you know, and we were looking to these spaces online. And conspiracy 
conspiracy theories tend to give people very easy answers to very complicated situations, which the brain really, really likes, especially in times of crisis, right? So again, there's a kind of psychological element. The algorithmic element is also very, very real. Um, there was a study or a bit of research done by The Guardian, I think, in 2020. And what they did is they joined anti-lockdown groups on Facebook and their recommendations were then filled with QAnon groups, right? Mm. And that's because the same kind of things were being discussed across these groups. So Facebook doesn't know that these are, you know, essentially, you know, pathways to extremist movements. So, they so just, if you started yeah. up a brand new Facebook account and the first, the only thing you ever did was join a lockdown scepticism group yeah. that basically the machine then said, oh, you might be interested in all these other yeah. fringe theories mm. exactly. and you would be presented with it without ever going to hunt it out. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask, it was reported in the Independent there the other day that, you know, the guards are looking into whether or not there are links between the international far right mm. movement and the Irish far right movement. That's like a real... Eureka moment there for, for 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 officials who haven't seen this coming as a load of people have been pointing to it for many yeah. years. Yeah. But what is the link there? I mean, there was reports that there was meetings, I think the Irish Times reported there was meetings between, I think it was Patriotic Alternative, mm. which is a big UK one, with Irish activists. That must be somewhat worrying from your perspective when you look at what's actually been happening. Like worrying, but not surprising. Yeah. And I think that there's there's this idea that um, what's happening in Ireland is just like an Irish thing. And yeah. it's not, it's a completely international movement. Like a lot of this is coming from um, yeah, groups like Patriotic Alternative in the, in the UK, the idea of like the Great Replacement Theory was kind of popularised by identitarian groups in Europe. Um, a lot of conspiratorial narratives around QAnon and stuff is obviously very US focused. So, you know, there's no borders on the internet. So they're always kind of um, borrowing language and tactics and, and different kind of strategies. They're always communicating across different groups, you know, internationally as well. So it's completely not surprising to me to see that there is that kind of communication going on because it has been going on for years. You mentioned that people are looking for easy answers to complex things. One person who offers some of those perceived answers is Andrew Tate, someone mm -hmm. who's become much more prominent in public life in the last couple of months, particularly given his run-ins with criminal law. Uh, let's just, for the sake of, of illustration, uh, play our listeners and our viewers uh, an example of the sort of rhetoric that he has been exposing online. This is what's scariest about this entire agenda they're trying to purport, because their ideas, like the feminist idea and like the mainstream idea and like Logan Paul's ideas, all their ideals is if we weaken men, then if they become weak enough, they'll no longer be a threat. And I argue that point absolutely. I think the most dangerous men on earth are the weak men. I think inside of every single man, we're born with a fire inside of us that if we do not control can destroy ourselves and other people. And if you look at men who have no emotional control, because that's what they're trying to teach us to have. They're saying, listen, you're a man, you're allowed to just cry all the time and have no emotional control, no stoicism, just be, come, react to your emotions. Do you know what happens when you tell men to just react to their emotions? Anger. You have school shootings, you have rape, you have violence. That's what happens when you tell men to have no emotional control. Aoife, how influential is somebody like Andrew Tate when it comes to young Irish men? I mean, is, is he actually having a huge impact? Um, yeah, I think so. And it kind of goes back to what I just said. Like the internet has no borders. So if something like this is becoming really prominent in places like the UK and the US, it is more than likely becoming prominent here as well. Andrew Tate is... There's, there's so much to unpack in that. In that clip. Know, it's, it's hard to lot. know where to start, it's right? Lot, yeah. um, Andrew Tate is, I suppose, the way to describe him is that he is one kind of member or iteration of what is a wider online movement that is often termed the Manosphere, right? So the Manosphere is kind of a name that is given to a kind of loosely linked collection of websites and influencers and, you know, message boards and things like that that all are linked by their fairly overt misogyny, right? Um, and this is something that's been kind of growing since the, the kind of very early days of the internet. And it goes from things like pickup artistry, which, you know, Andrew Tate's kind of involved in as well, kind of gamifying ways to, to kind of pick up women and things like mm -hmm. that, to the very extreme end of uh, the spectrum would be like incels, right? The kind of involuntary celibates mm -hmm. that I think a lot of, you know, some people would know about. Um, and Andrew Tate kind of takes a couple of different elements of this kind of manosphere rhetoric. The other thing about the manosphere is that they have very, they use language in a very specific way to both talk about men and women. Um, and again, very much like rooted in, in kind of misogynism as well. Um, the Manosphere was also one of the first movements to popularize the use of the term red pilling. Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of used now to describe essentially people becoming radicalized into kind of right wing mm. conspiratorial thought. But in the manosphere, it was used to describe an awakening to the idea that feminism was the root cause of 
Oh, Can I ask you though, is it just the manosphere that you talk about or is, is his reach much more mainstream than that? Because I'm going to be honest thing. and we had a conversation in a meeting and the lads kind of scoffed because I was like, I hadn't heard of Andrew Tate before he got arrested. So yeah. I don't know, was that my algorithm or what happened? I mm. wasn't familiar with Andrew Tate and a lot of my friends weren't familiar with Andrew Tate and everyone on the meeting was shocked that I hadn't heard of him. Mm. But I hadn't. Like, so I don't know, is his reach quite mainstream or is it, is it locked in as you call it, the manosphere? No, it's definitely become way more mainstream and I'd be a bit the same as you. I mean, I hadn't heard of him until late last year. It was before mm. the arrest, but you know, when he, when he was kicked off all the platforms and all that there. Um, and I think that he, again, people have done this in the past and he's just kind of the newest person that has been able to do this, but he's been really good at gaming algorithms in order to push his content and, and make it viral. And he does this in a very specific way, actually. Mm. Um, so he, people have heard he has set up a kind of academy called Hustlers University, mm. which is essentially a bit of a pyramid scheme. So members will join. They'll be said that they can learn how to become rich and get women and all the rest. But they have also been given commission to post Andrew Tate's videos online, right? Yeah. And they've been told to post the most controversial ones, the ones that will essentially get what we term like outrage bait. Do you know what I mean? So they will drive engagement. Exactly. Yeah. And that is why he went so viral, because he had all of these people posting his videos on TikTok that were again being pushed into this for you algorithm um, and that were being targeted at young men. Can I ask about this? Because actually it's something I noticed on TikTok at some point there last year when I hadn't a clue who this was and I saw this sunglassed bald headed fella with a goatee beard mm. um, and I was like, who is this? And I started seeing memes about him. Mm. But after clicking on and seeing the memes, I mean, then you start seeing the real stuff of his. Yeah. But anecdotally, I'm sure you might have heard this as well, is that this is becoming something where teachers and schools in Ireland are having to have conversations with young boys about it mm. because it is that common now. How susceptible are young boys in particular to this? Because there is that machismo thing which Tate is sort of like trying to exemplify. But mm -hmm. it's something which 12, 13, 14 year old boys they're naturally going to gravitate towards, isn't it? Yeah, and I mean, I don't pretend to know like what, you know, the problems are to, with young boys and, and, and men, but I did ask a couple of colleagues about this, to be honest. <laughs> um, and they kind of made the point that it's very easy to exploit a young man's or a, a boy's, um, I suppose, his view of sex and relationships. Yeah. So you can present this image that you can have loads of sex if you do all the things that I do. And that's very tempting, I'd say, to, to young men. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and then there's also, they kind of made the point that there's this kind of crisis of masculinity and a lot of young boys don't really know how they're meant to be a, a man. Do you know what I mean? So mm. there's kind of, there's a couple of different things going on there. And Andrew Tate wouldn't be successful if he wasn't tapping into those very, very real things. Um, so I think there needs to be maybe more of a conversation about how to answer those issues for young mm. men instead of having them being answered through this really really, really horrendous, misogynistic kind of movements that are taking place online. I think that crisis of masculinity is a topic we'll definitely return to again. Mm. Ifa, thank you so mm. much for coming in and giving us your insight. We really appreciate it. No problem.